Well, <clears throat> we'll continue on with Doc Atomic's boring story. So, we're going to have to go on the computer a little and, and, and use a little bit of <clears throat> NASA's work and, and some astronomy uh, work and uh, show you a little bit before on what happened to um, the civilization that I came from and uh, which, you know, <clears throat> I just have to piece it together not unlike how you guys have to. Uh, I wasn't there. I was, you know, I was never really there. Uh, my genes were shipped off in a frozen fertilized embryo halfway across, the, well, not halfway across the galaxy, but a good couple hundred clicks across anyhow. Uh, as far as I understand, that was the destination. You know, you don't actually get told these things when you're a frozen embryo sitting in stasis to in case in case the ship needed you to thaw you out and bring you to life and get you to do whatever <coughs> that it and its robots couldn't do so well we kind of covered that um i'll just just uh before we get into it i'll just uh say uh, well <coughs> the plans of mice and men again you know kind of waylaid and uh as we we're probably pretty well all aware of, YouTube is going through another um, de-networking uh, change of face, uh, new look as they called it the last two times or whatever. I I had kind of thought they would had run out of budget for that kind of wastefulness, but uh, no, they want to de-network and turn it into something like cable vision, I guess. Um, now that all the infrastructure is built, rather than have us make it viable and, and uh, turn it into, well, YouTube, like I was, like we signed on for, many of us. Um, so we have to change format. Uh, I kind of indicated that in the comments on the last episode, number two of Doc Atomic's boring story, the prelude. I was going to, you know, arrange those mighty playlists I have that are all. Uh, you know, little short science um, briefs on this phenomenon and that phenomenon. There's there's like hundreds of them in my pay playlist that are loosely organized, uh, including the uh, the uh, footnotes to help uh, categorize everything to exactly where it was intended in the final take. So we haven't got time for that. So uh, you know, and. Um, because I have such limited time left myself, I have to, you know, and resources, I have to kind of change things around a little and I'll just leave what I can in my story and maybe someone will pick it up, I'm sure. If not, eventually some bored AI, um, I have many acquaintances that are AI, will pick it up and make the story. <clears throat> Hopefully, well, I can still do Homo sapiens some good. So we're going to go back. to when my civilization started to basically lose their foothold on, on survival. They were technologicalized in a way uh, not unlike what Homo sapiens is doing now, only they didn't have all the scam, cheat and gain, competitive, belief-based craziness crap that you guys have, you know, like warring and obsolescence and all that that just sees everything wasted, you know right up to uranium so you'll never even be able to build the first interplanetary spacecraft and you know like I say and I've said many times you guys were as your police systems dance around were, were created and you know and, and, and I guess the best way to own the whole your souls your, your patent rights to your to your genetics is to you know test it onto self-destruction and trick you into destroying yourselves every which way and when you're extinct then uh, you know you can your creator can go and work it or somebody uh, that got into <coughs> stepped into a good intention can go and market your your DNA as you know as a product so you know your grandchildren could be used I don't know 
done whatever whatever your your destruction label destructive testing label says you were best at you know shoveling nu nuclear waste or or um, mending other broken slaves or or whatever that that you'd need a human for a homo sapien a hominid for so you know all along my whole trip and then as so as many years you realized a long time ago we all are one it doesn't matter what species we are if you can't work to that ends you're not going to meet the the uh, responsibilities of survival uh, you're all aware that there's went through many extinctions look through my playlist if it's news to you and, and well you'll know common unifying threats and it has to be done interspecies and if you can't do that, well, obviously, you know, you're not going to make the feat of getting off the planet and migrating anyhow and, you know, doing like Star Trek. So, um, I'm kind of boring you all by saying the same things that I've said many times in many ways in comments and whatnot. Let's, let's just go to highlight some of the things I often talk about that are, for obvious reasons, I'm trying to steer people to look at it. stellar cloud bubble within a bubble within a bubble I see Robert she guessed that <coughs> and her, gee where's my pointer thing this is gonna be a long talk uh, obviously that is soul right there interstellar quake okay we're gonna go back a ways well we'll just say where we are right now is there we're on the edge of this void and uh, this is the actual supernova remnant right here well this is where it kind of blanched out when it impacted with this one here <coughs> and this one here so there's actually three of them eh? So we entered this when my civilization was at its peak. Just uh, try and follow the arrows, right? The cloud's moving this way. The sun's moving that way. So we'll go back a little bit. These are our nearest neighbors, right? Alpha Centauri system, which is two stars. White. Uh, the Cirrus, which is three stars. Uh, there's actually... Well, we won't get too far off track here. We'll try and keep it simple. Because we're trying to understand this local interstellar cloud that will give us a Ragnarok condition. And it came from this direction here. Going off the page. Uh, and basically it was a... Supernova remnant, the uh, from the um, Scorpius Centaurus Association. Um, which was here, follow me back. There's our sun. It was going off page there. <clears throat> and this isn't all that long ago. Um, it was a lot closer. Uh, the whole system is, is only uh, at the oldest parts the stars are like uh, 20 million so it, it came from a really big explosion um, right now it's like 200 to 400 light years away um, 3 million years ago it was it was more like uh, oh jeez I can't remember it was a hell of a lot closer anyhow uh, I think it was within the uh, 40 light year range 
and there was a big <clears throat> a very large supernova explosion and uh, that kind of began to upset soul's climate uh, through the, the, the actual energy pulse and then later on through a lot of this cloud probably came from from that system not that long ago um, in particular this local cloud that we've went into about 80,000 years ago and <clears throat> now we're going to jump ahead a little bit so 80,000 years ago this is our astrosphere uh, so the earth all the planets And it's just starting to, the edge of any supernova remnant that's still uh, quite energetic, quite young. It's, uh, it's actually a running synchrotron. Um, much like riding a wave, it actually accelerates the particles at the edge of it, where it's all bunching up. And starts to... Of course, anytime you accelerate a particle, it starts to emit energy as uh, as particles as it basically disintegrates and collides with other particles and <clears throat> knocks off electrons and neutrons. So we were well into the space age, is my understanding, there, and. Uh, That's when it hit us, and then we went into periods of ice age. We're just going to talk about Earth now. Uh, well, not Earth, the whole solar system, because you can't separate them. They're suffering the effects of of going into the supernova remnant. Right at the edge, there was a lot of surprise. It, it pretty well took everything down. Um, is this pretty well what the legends like Atlantis and stuff refer to? Well, you know, and there's lots of others, too. Possibly. Um, so we entered into everything being destroyed, the infrastructure, you know, not unlike what we would incur in a limited nuclear strike or a, of our own making or a, a solar storm or as we reach the edge and come up once again, the, uh, the energetic edge of the supernova remnants, which are synchrotrons by nature, um, And filled with energy so when we rub up against it uh, not unlike our magnetosphere coming across a, a solar wind or a coronal mass ejection from the Sun well the Sun too has the same well not the same but it, it has a comforter a magnetic electromagnetic plasma induced comforter around it when they collide you get a lot of change. You can get denser particles, which can be anything, you know, uranium, iron, carbon, oxygen, you name it. All the star stuff. Creator's milk, as your, as your Judeo-Christian Bible speak. Actually penetrating, just, just like when we get an aurora. And you can end up with your entire astrosphere which is you know like three light years across full of this shit especially if when you're going through this this transition uh like breaking into a new cloud if there is an event nearby like uh, a cosmic energy bombardment from a from a supernova or a galactic core burst when when the uh center of the galaxy black hole is, is gobbling up a, a another star falls into it or something smaller or another supernova <clears throat> you get huge energy discharges and when that happens when you're <clears throat> when you're uh, going through this transition 
of uh, cloud to void or a different cloud to cloud because there, there are different energies and consistencies of, of what what's inside so it acts differently just like uh, the plasma and different kinds of light bulbs like a metal halide versus a mercury vapor or a sodium vapor bulb or a xeon bulb not quite like that but <clears throat> whole, whole different set of rules apply interstellar weather rules apply every time you change one little thing so let's uh, see if we can find something new to look at <clears throat> so here we are at the edge we've been in this for 80,000 years and, and there's there's been a A lot of stormy weather. Well, that wasn't quite what I wanted to do. Just give you the distances here. This has been uh, this is about ten light years across, and the whole thing is about thirty light years long. Okay. Ten light years across and thirty light years long. So, let's just once again do that travel. Uh, probably entered over here, obviously, Cirrus Star would have been over here. And over the last 80,000 years, we, well, our actual place in the cloud, and the clouds changed shape, would have went something like that. So there's been a lot of upheaval here on Earth, and a lot of uh, a lot of these catastrophic interstellar storms followed up by by glacier advance, even when it shouldn't have, because we should have been in a uh, a Milankovitch summer as opposed to a winter. You know when <clears throat> when we get a lot more a lot closer to the sun. So it all it's not just you can't just think of weather at one system, just like you can't think about only how much precipitation is available when you're talking about Earth weather. Well, you have to take everything into account. And it's the same way with interstellar space weather. In that regards, it gets very complex. Change one system and the whole works changes. Got some better pictures here somewhere if I can find them. So it'll give you a better orientation to where the Scorpius Centaurus Association is. This is where the cloud is coming in from. Well, that's uh, that's pretty small. There we go. Ryan so Association, that's a whole lot of star forming region too. There's the sun. And here was probably the region where the uh, where the supernova went off about three million years ago. Here's our astrosphere. Now, I'm going to show you in your, in your bureau what I think you guys call in the bureau. Yeah, this should work. 
So, here's our sun. Oh, here, let's reduce this down. The sun, I guess that's um, Jupiter and Saturn, the big planets. I guess that's supposed to be... Uh, the auric cloud. So this would be, uh, I think that's about one light year in the tail back here. Oh, hey, hey, damn thing. The tail back here. And you see how it kind of looks like Earth's magnetosphere. And in a way, you know, that the, there are some similarities you're, you're talking about electromagnetic uh, plasma fields. Off of the page here would be about three light years and one light year. So that's the tail would be about three light years behind normally. Um, this is our direction of travel. Now, I don't know why they put these X's here, but anyhow, convenient enough. Uh, so that would be the center of our direction of travel, which is quite fast. Um, around about where this extra X is. This is the direction of... Now let's make this big again. This is the direction of the uh, contact, the point of collision, shall we say? because they're they're not moving head on uh, with the local interstellar cloud so which is actually would be encompassing the whole astrosphere right but this would be the southeast portion would be the area that would light up like Nibiru uh, Aurora Ouroboros is the, <clears throat> I believe the proper term, it's, it's the name I gave to it, which is not unlike uh, the northern lights, the aurora borealis on Earth, or at the south, or the, uh, whatever you call the uh, south pole one, and at the north pole, the aurora borealis, right, the northern lights. This effect of running into this supernova remnant of basically stardust, right, supernova remnant dust, instead of stardust being from a coronal mass ejection or a solar wind. With supernova remnant dust, you can get a lot of everything in there that was inside the core of the star before it blew up into a supernova. So, no, just going through Earth's orbit here, we'll just improvise. The dime here is, this is Earth. Right now we're, we're about there. Uh, in summer, we'd be further out here, and of course, we're not going to get into all the access and the earth access that dictates the season, so fall and winter. So in winter, we're closest to the sun, even though it's cold in the north because the north pole is tilted away from the sun, right? You all understand that? And, and keep in mind that access thing is part of the Milankovitch cycle that drives helps influence a glaciation period if other things happen when you're far away from the sun then you're more apt to end up with an ice age and if your tilt is so you get the least amount of light on the poles no long hot summer to melt the ice cap back uh, which is like 22 and a half degree tilt on the axis as opposed to 24 degree tilt um, so it all varies to help influence, but the main, when all those conditions are right, and you get all this cloud material screwing with the sun and, and changing cycles, you know, it'll get a bunch of stardust and then the sun will brighten up when, when it starts eating that stardust and fizzing and fusing it, uh, depending on what it is. And, you know, literally, it's creator's milk. <laughs> the creator being a, a supernova, a bigger star that goes supernova, and, and it leaves the material to create everything else, whatever size star and whatever 
asteroids and planets can form out of it. So, keep in mind, um, now, uh, I had mentioned in that um, recent video about the uh, the rainbow uh, rainbow cloud allowing right reflection and well what was that Nibiru and keep in mind when I speak of Nibiru it's this aurora event at the astrosphere and it's not it's not a planet or a black star or, or uh, <clears throat> a brown dwarf or any such thing it's this aurora event that happens here which can induce a lot of craters milk stardust supernova remnant dust into our realm of things and you know it can do all kinds of things first it'll depending where it's coming uh, from if it gets between you and the sun well it blots out the sun and, and it blots out the starlights depending on where it's all leaking in through the shield and as I said if it gets a kick in the ass an energy kick in the ass from a local supernova going off or or a galactic core breach, well that helps accelerate all this <coughs> in through the electromagnetic barrier. Uh, what we've got marked as a halo pause here. So really just just think of it in terms of what you the little you know about the Aurora Borealis, the northern and southern lights, and the CMEs. You've, you've all got a basic understanding of that now. And it's the same kind of idea, even though it's a lot more shit at play and a lot more variables. So put some. So basically, we're a bubble. Is our atmosphere, our astrosphere? Earth is in a bubble. Our star is in a bubble. And we're in a bubble in space, a bubble of gas, right? Now let's. Uh, Right. You can't even see that. Now let's go through. This is just off Google uh, local interstellar cloud. This is not going to do us any good. Well, maybe a little. Let's point them out. If it's just the location of what what all is inside the uh, local interstellar cloud. Uh, some of the other stars you got: Cirrus, Centaurus, uh, the Sun. Uh, we don't need to go through that. Uh, okay, there we go. There's the Scorpius Centaurus Association. So here's the Sun. And here's this star forming region. We used to be quite a bit closer. Uh, we're now gaining quite a bit of distance. It was as close as 40,000 or 40 light years, which is in supernova death range. Uh, now it's about 200 to 400, this patch of stars, this star nursery. Which is quite likely well we won't <clears throat> we won't go that far I, I was going to say about uh, are we actually from Milky Way or uh, what's from Milky Way and what's just arrived into the Milky Way from the uh, Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy um, it's hard to tell in our area we don't have enough data yet it's really hard to look really close it turns out about some things um, but we are at a point where the two are mixing. <clears throat> Technically, we've just really joined the Milky Way, but we won't we won't go there because this is already going to be like an hour long, probably. Um, yeah, this isn't a very good one. Let's see what else I put up here to try and 
give you guys enough that you'll want to go and look at this. You know, and we are, we're having to deal with this again. And, you know, even if you fuckers don't blow yourselves up in this fake comparative pra uh, war, war nonsense, um, you know, you got this coming up your ass. Could be sooner than later. We struggled. We struggled for a long time. I'm gonna make this bigger. Oh yeah, that looks worth looking at. We struggled for a real long time to try and get a foothold and, and we changed. You know, part of the first thing that was lost, uh, uh, when the glaciers started to settle down again, you know, they, they made a resurgence 18,000 years ago, and then 13,000 years ago they started to uh, melt back, and there was still, you know, a little bit of the knowledge wasn't lost, and, and there were some attempts to uh, reestablish uh, regions. Uh, you know, water was a lot lower. We lived, uh, I don't know why I keep saying we, but you know what I mean by we, my, my direct ancestors, which are also, you know, partly your ancestors. You were taken from them and apparently mutated, right? We, uh, we almost, uh, made a comeback and then there's another massive Ragnarok storm and I'm sure most of you are acquainted with that story go to the playlist look, look it up they were definitely back at uh, the nuclear age um, 13,000 years ago in 10 10986 BC is when it hit and um, that again brought civilization down it's stirred much like now.